So now all that's left to do is install the final piece of bodywork and we can get this thing started up. And there you have it. Doesn't this car just look absolutely incredible? Let's go ahead and get this thing fired up. In the last episode, we spent a significant amount of time fabricating the chassis for this car. But looking ahead at what we have to do to complete the build, we haven't even scratched the surface. As it currently stands, this isn't really a car yet. It's more or less the world's worst canoe. So in this video, we're going to fix that. But before we get into throwing race car parts at this car, I have to explain a few things. See in motorsport, you have what we call real world rich and motorsport poor. And you see, I'm neither of those things. I guess I'm what you would call real world poor. Because we're poor? Exactly. But I'm not going to let that stop us from chasing this dream. During my time working for Hyper Racer, I've had this little box that we like to call Zach's Box of Factory Seconds Parts. As we've been running these cars for a number of years and building larger quantities every year, some things have changed for the sake of reliability and manufacturing efficiency. For instance, the cooling system has been revised, fabricated steel components are now being machined out of billet aluminium, and carbon layups have been tweaked for increased stiffness and durability. This has resulted in some older parts being thrown my way. It's something that I thought would be worth mentioning just in case any of you are interested in buying a new Hyper Racer X1 and were wondering why the tunnels come from factory with 17 carbon repairs and several holes that I don't actually know where they came from. These bad boys did two years of racing and thought they were going into retirement. I'll do anything for free race car parts. But now that you know why my X1 is going to look a little more tired than all the rest, let's get into building it. To kick things off, we can first install the firewall and the custom made fuel tank for the X1. Now in the previous episode, I had skipped over the suspension design as it was going to be easier to explain how it works with the components installed on the finished chassis. So let's start by installing these components and I'll do my best to explain how it all works. So here's the concept. The single front and rear shocks primarily control the car's pitch along the transversal axis of the car. Braking, accelerating, aero load all go through the shocks. Then you've got the sway bar. This is mounted to the chassis on a spherical bearing so that it can rotate like this. So in roll type events along the longitudinal axis of the car, the load from the wheel is transferred through the push rod and into the sway bar where it can rotate like before. Now you're probably wondering, how is this roll controlled? With these, polyurethane rubbers. These sway bar pins can be moved inward and outwards to change the leverage point, providing more or less load on the polyurethane rubber, and in turn, making the car roll more or less. Pretty neat and very cost effective. So now you know how the suspension system works. Let's move on to getting this engine into the car. Because, well I mean, do I need to explain this to you? Have you ever heard a Hayabusa scream at over 10,000 RPM? Sounds bloody awesome, mate. You're just sitting there, rolling through the gears about 180 kilometers an hour, wind's blowing in your face, and you don't even know If we're going to do any of what I just said, we're going to need to find ourselves an engine. Don't do it. I'm a virgin. Ah, uh, no. Right, now that we've dealt with that issue, here's our Hayabusa engine in all her glory and ready for her new home. Well, not quite. This engine needs a clean up as well as a good freshen up internally. Because we're putting an engine that was designed to go into a motorbike into a race car, there's a few things that we're going to need to do to increase the lifespan of this engine. The first thing is the case studs. This upgrade prevents the bottom end cases from flexing due to the increased sustained RPM experienced in a race car. Without this upgrade, the cases have the potential to flex, allowing the main crank bearings to move, blocking the oil gallery, and ending in tears. Secondly, we've removed half of the blades in the water pump as it's driven directly off the crank. Just like the previous issue, with the increase in sustained RPM due to it being in a race car, Leaving this unmodified can cause cavitation in the cooling system. Lastly, the valve springs are also upgraded to prevent any valve float with this increase in RPM. With the engine back together, 
I was about to launch this thing in the X1, having only pressure washed it with a little bit of truck wash. When Hardy from next door walked over, shaking his head in disappointment. New cars normally have their engine work completed by Hardy, and I cleaned to the point where they look like a guy named Yoshimatsu had just hand assembled it in the Suzuki factory. After Hardy had completed his magic, we can go ahead and install the factory Suzuki wiring loom, as well as the clutch line, brake line, fuel lines, and oil cooler lines. Now the engine can be hoisted halfway into position before the engine mounts are bolted into their respective sides. The engine then makes its way into its final resting place and can be fastened to the chassis. And there you have it. We now have an engine in this car. We need a way to convert all of this horsepower back here and out the sides of the car to the wheels. This is where things get pretty cool and somewhat unconventional to adhere to the concept of a low cost and minimal maintenance race car. The car doesn't have a differential. It's a fully spooled, chain driven rear end. This assembly of aluminum water jet plates, spacers, bolts and some CNC components utilizes the engine's existing chain drive system and spins the rear axle which is where both of the CV shafts then transfer the power to the rear wheels. So let's go ahead and assemble one. Starting with the plates themselves, then the CNC bearing carriers, the drive axle, crossover spacers, the chain tensioner components, sprocket carrier, more spacers, drive axle retainer, idler sprocket, and the bearings. And the... Do we not have any bearings? Hang on. A few moments later. And then the bearings. Now we can start pressing this thing together. It's a little bit of trying to remember which pin to use on the hydraulic press and patience as you press a 200mm cylinder through a bearing. I don't want to bore you too much with the assembly, but the rest of the parts can be bolted together on the table before it gets hoisted in the back of the car. This particular job is very technical and requires a highly skilled individual to be capable of installing the rear drive assembly. Nice. If you've made it this far in the video, chances are you're probably enjoying yourself. And if that is the case, you should go ahead and check out my Patreon, where you can help to support the channel and even get your name stickered on the car. The final thing we'll cover is the installation of the control arms, uprights and steering system. We'll start by pre-assembling the uprights so they can be bolted directly to the control arms. The assembly starts by pressing the wheel hub bearings into the upright, followed by the hub itself. While the upright itself is machined specifically for the X1, it's designed to house this bearing and hub from a Subaru, making it super easy to get parts for. Next, we can mount the caliper mounts and then the brake rotors, which are just laser cut Bizzolo steel, mounted on a billet rotor hat. Once we have the rotor installed, we can then mount the caliper to the upright and torque all of the bolts. The control arms mount to the car using appropriately sized rod ends, urethane bushes that are cast in-house, and spherical bearings. It doesn't take long for the rest of the suspension to come together. The lower control arm goes on first, then the push rod is installed, connecting the lower control arm to the bell cranks. Then when you realise you've done it all wrong, you have to remove the push rod so you can fit the upper control arm before reinstalling the push rod. Now we can install those uprides that we assembled earlier. To connect the tie rods and upper control arm to the upright, we install this steering arm that bolts to the upright, giving us the ability to connect all of the components. We can also install the factory 3mm camber shim, which will be used later on to adjust the camber. Next, we can go ahead and complete a similar process for the rear of the car. First, the lower control arm goes in, along with an engine cross brace that helps brace the lower section of the chassis, which is open to allow installation of the engine. Next, we can install the push rod and upper control arm similar to before. To assist with mounting the rear upright and camber arms, we've added a spigot to the end of the bolt to make it easier to locate the camber arm and the thread in the upright. Now this is where things get pretty neat. Right now, this car is about as straight as a rainbow. While we're eventually going to align it on the ground, it would be nice if there was a way to mostly align the car and ensure that the chassis is at least leveled before being corner weighted. Introducing our laser alignment tool. 
This contraption houses a laser on a linear rail, allowing us to align every aspect of the car. The alignment tool is leveled with the chassis by adjusting its angle until the measurements are the same on both sides of the car. Now that the laser is level with the chassis, we can set the ride height by adjusting the pushrod lengths until each upright reads the required value. We can even use this to get the rear camber as close to where it needs to be as possible. The car will still have its camber adjusted when it's sitting on the ground, so these don't need to be incredibly precise for now. The last thing we can do is set the caster to the factory values. The lower rear control arm is not adjustable, so we can use this as a datum point to measure the distance from it to the top and bottom points of the front upright. Adjusting the rod ends on the top and bottom control arm allows us to adjust the caster until the measurements are correct. Essentially, we've just taken these measurements from a car that has been fully lined and we know is good and copied them onto this car as a starting point. So now we have our camber, caster and ride height set pretty close to where they need to be. This will make the final alignment on the ground a much easier process. Next, we can install the steering rack. As mentioned at the start of the video, this is one of the old spec steering racks. Now we make our own CNC billet racks, but I'm too poor for that. After bolting the rack onto the car and attempting to install the tie rods into the old generation fabricated clevises, I realized that I didn't have any suitable spaces to make this work. Then I remembered we have a lathe. So I got to work taking some measurements and machining a set of spaces that would fit perfectly between the rod end and the clevis, but they didn't fit. A small revision to amend the lack of any included tolerance and they fit like a glove. Now we can assemble the steering column, which is fabricated and cerakoted in-house. The column can then be mounted to the chassis and tested out for the first time. Perfect. The car's coming along nicely. In the next episode, we're going to get all of the bodywork finished and installed on the car. And it's going to completely transform how the thing drives, but also how it looks. Once again, thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. And thank you for all the support on the first episode. The support has been immense and I can't wait to get this thing on the track for you all to see.